This is Thursday, February 7th, 2013. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Ron Michael. Welcome, Ron. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, it, it's good to have you, uh, have you here, too. Uh, may I ask when you were born? I was born May 8, 1937 at Newton Wellesley Hospital. And where did you live during your childhood? I lived most of my life over at 44 Oak Street in East Natick. And do you still live in Natick? I do still live in Natick with my wife. Okay. And no children? No children. Okay. You have a very interesting family background. Uh, for example, your great-great-grandfather was in the Civil War. Tell us a bit about him. The great-great-grandfather was Captain Matthew Elder, mm -hmm. and he was killed at uh, 5 o'clock in the afternoon on uh, July 3rd at the bottom of Little Round Top. And he left four little children uh, on a farm out in Michigan, and I come from that uh, family that survived. And, uh, of course, Little Round Top is at Gettysburg. At Gettysburg, mm -hmm. right, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I went there a few years ago on a, uh, doing a little genealogy and research mm -hmm. with a guide, and he took me right to the spot, and he was able to tell me at 5 o'clock in the afternoon that where he was killed within like 50 feet of the area. Wow. Because they know the company that he was in mm -hmm. and who was shooting against him from like South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite emotional to stand there and think that mm -hmm. part of my relative was killed right here 150 years ago. Unbelievable. Yeah. And your uncle was in World War II. My uncle Walter, my father's brother, mm -hmm. flew uh, B-17s out of Foggia Field, Italy, 33 times. But the story goes that when he left the United States in his B-17, his mother lived down in Newton. And as he flew over Newton, he told her when with the squadron, and he did the wings <laughs> and waved goodbye to her. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's supposed to be a true story. Mm -hmm. yeah. And your aunt was a nurse. My aunt, Ethel uh, Boswell from Natick, she uh, enlisted in the, uh, I believe what they call it, the uh, Army Nurses Corps probably, mm -hmm. and went to North Africa, from North Africa to Sicily, from Sicily to Anzio Beachhead for six weeks, and she was only alive to tell us the stories because she told me some horrendous stories about mm -hmm. the, what, the, what they took from the Germans in Italy there. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And what did your parents do for, uh, for a living? My mother was a housewife mm -hmm. and my father uh, was a, an accountant. For, he was, he's retired from the controller of the YWCA as a boss. So you lived in Natick, yeah. and you lived in Natick during a very interesting period. Yes, yeah. There was a lot going on during the war that I can remember. I was about eight years old in mm -hmm. World War II with the blackouts, mm -hmm. putting wooden boards over the cellar windows. My father was an air raid warden, and I still have his helmet that says uh, Natick Auxiliary Fire Department. <laughs> yeah. There was a whole group of men mm -hmm. at that time. We lived in East Natick, and uh, mm -hmm. they, uh, but they went around at night checking to make sure everybody had their windows closed because they wanted the East Coast uh, blackened for the World War II. Mm -hmm. What else do you remember about uh, World War II and Natick? World War II and Natick. I can remember my father and my uncle Andrew going over to the train station there by Walnut Street and getting on the train and waving goodbye to them. Mm -hmm. But it was uh, kind of interesting. Three days later, they were both home. They both had high blood pressure. My father lived to be 93, my <laughs> uncle lived to be about 90, <laughs> but neither one of them could go in the service. They, they were got, older at the time, it was yeah. the end of the war, mm -hmm. so they, they didn't take them. Okay. And yeah. where did you go to school? I went to St. Patrick's School mm -hmm. up till the seventh grade. Then we did a lot of moving around for a few years and I graduated from Natick High School in 1956. And that was the then brand new Natick High School? Brand new, just about a year old. Mm -hmm. Right. So you grew up in Natick in the early 50s yeah. when the population just started just, growing. I saw all of East Natick developed with uh, MacArthur Road, all the names after the generals of the war. Mm -hmm. I lived at 44 Oak Street and there was the town forest, but right after the war, like in 48 and 49, Sumner Hershey started developing uh, MacArthur Road, Eisenhower Road, all that area. 
And uh, I always thought as a little child that that was my backyard <laughs> until they put a bulldozer in there one day. And, mm. yeah. uh, parenthetically, do you remember the GE house? The GE house. It was supposedly, it's supposedly on MacArthur Road. It was, a bit, it was like a publicity stunt for a movie called Mr. Blanding's Built His Dream House. Mr. Blanding's Dream House is on the left-hand side going up the hill, and a friend of mine that went to Natick High School named Laurie Wells lived in that house. No fooling. Yeah, he, he, I didn't know him very well because he transferred in like from out in the, the west somewhere. Mm -hmm. He only lived here a short time, but he actually lived in Mr. Blanding's Dream House. And I can remember it being all decorated, mm -hmm. uh, like with ribbon. Uh, mm -hmm. It was named after that movie that they made. Mm. Right, I do remember that very well. Okay. Yeah. So what did you do after high school? I never finished Natick High School. I went in the Marines. You went, you went right into the Marines? On Valentine's Day, which is a week away. Valentine's Day, 1956, I left Natick High School and joined the Marines. You enlisted? I enlisted. And why the Marine Corps? Well, I was reading that in your questionnaire, and I says, uh, I really don't have a good answer, Maureen, mm -hmm. but I says, I think I might have been influenced, influenced by jo John Wayne and the Sands of Iwo Jima, everyone that lived in East Natick, the Lilja boys that were killed. Mm -hmm. They had a brother that's my age that survived. The boy that lived next door to me, Warren Bassett, joined the Marines. Mm -hmm. Mr. Zico lived across the street, was a Marine veteran. Mm -hmm. And Joe Sheridan, who was a disabled veteran, you know, highly decorated from World War II, lived, lived next door. So I had Mr. Sheridan's influence, mm -hmm. Mr. Wayne Warren Bassett that lived next door, Mr. Zico lived across the street, and... Uh, so it sounds like you had the backing of most of East Natick. Yeah, most of East Natick. And then mm -hmm. when I left high school, uh, Bobby Galani followed me into the Marines mm -hmm. from my same class. Bucko Walsh, Edward Walsh followed me into the Marines from the same class. Jackie Jacobs uh, mm -hmm. followed me into the Marines, was in boot camp with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think at the time, in 1956, after the Korean War had just ended, there was still that strong influence of, you know, join mm -hmm. the Marines. So, I so just, you joined. I joined. <laughs> just followed along. All right. So where did you go for basic? I went to basic uh, training down at Paris Island, South Carolina, and uh, I have a little interesting story. A boot camp. It was mm -hmm. uh, quite a change to go from Natick in 1956 to South Carolina. Uh, the, fr the first thing that happened was that it was still segregated, which I found very difficult to, at the time to adjust to the segregation, because mm -hmm. there were black Marines in boot camp with us, mm -hmm. and when we got out. They couldn't go to the bathroom or go to the restaurants with us. And I says that, you know, you say the way the world is today, just in 50 years later, but I was 18 years old and I just couldn't believe it. And uh, boot camp went along fairly smoothly for me, but mm -hmm. one night right in the middle of it, at about three o'clock in the morning, they woke us up. I was at the rifle range to make sandwiches. I was on KP duty for a week. They alternated us. And a drill instructor came back from being on Liberty mm -hmm. and he had been drinking and he took his platoon out into the, what they call the boondocks mm -hmm. and three kids drowned. I shouldn't say kids, three, three young Marines drowned mm -hmm. out behind the rifle range and they call it the Ribbon Creek incident. Mm -hmm. And uh, his name, and I can say it, is McEwen because it's public knowledge. Mm -hmm. And he was from Worcester and uh, I've, I've heard there's books written about it and everything, but that was uh, quite a night. That, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was crazy, too, in boot camp, the things that went on, so it's uh, kind of hard to explain. But mm -hmm. it was peacetime, but yet uh, it, was, it was cuckoo. Yeah, it was also Cold War. Huh? The uh, Cold War. The Cold War, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, after boot camp, uh, then they sent you up to Camp Geiger, which is part of Camp Lejeune for uh, infantry training. And uh, that lasts for maybe six or eight weeks. And then uh, I was transferred to uh, 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 Courthouse Bay, which is part of Camp Lejeune and Onslow Beach, to an amphibious tractor battalion. And uh, I wasn't there very long. And they put a thing up on the bulletin board, 
anybody would like to go to school in California? And I said, oh, that sounds great. So I signed up and they sent me off to uh, Camp Pendleton for about four months to go to uh, amphibious tractor school. And uh, that went well. We came back from there and the time was going by fast. Mm. Next thing I knew, we were up at Little Creek, Virginia for the summer of 57, teaching midshipmen how to make landings. And we were living with a uh, UDT outfit at Little Creek, uh, which was really interesting to watch them uh, train. Mm -hmm. And uh, then in 1958, uh, we were gonna go on a med cruise. And we left Moorhead City, North Carolina around the 1st of January, 1958. And we landed in Gibraltar and did all the Mediterranean cities. Uh, that was the way that med cruise worked. You'd go to from Gibraltar, Barcelona, Spain, Nice, France, Cannes, mm -hmm. Sardinia, Livorno, Italy, Naples, Palermo, Italy, Rhodes, Greece, Mersin, Turkey. And we were doing all of this. And then all of a sudden we said, well, it's time to go back to the States. So we headed for Gibraltar. We got halfway to Gibraltar. We're in the middle of the Mediterranean and they wanted us to go to Beirut, Lebanon. It was around June, 1958. So the ship turned around and it was called the USS Spiegel Grove. Uh, it's a landing ship dock and the uh, fantail of it, I'll use my hand, went right down into the ocean and we had these landing craft inside that would go right out into the ocean. Okay, let's hold for a moment. Uh, what was your rank at the time? I was a corporal at that time. You were a corporal, and what was your uh, what were your duties? Well, from going to school in California, mm -hmm. I was an Amtrak mechanic. Mm -hmm. So I had a combination job. I was actually a driver, and mm -hmm. I was a mainly a mechanic. We had ten vehicles that I was in charge of, mm -hmm. and they finally promoted me to sergeant while I was there, mm -hmm. and. Uh, for, for doing the duty of keeping them running at, okay. in Beirut. Tell us why you were sent to Beirut. Dag Hammarskjöld was a UN peacekeeping force. Mm -hmm. And I believe the Syrians and the Lebanese uh, were having problems. And just our presence there at that time for about six months, mm -hmm. everything calmed down. So you didn't um, have any active engagements with the locals, no battles or anything? No, no battles like that. The mm -hmm. active uh, involvement with the locals would have been the civilian population of Beirut, mm -hmm. which were more like uh, uh, becoming friends with us, feeding us. We had to get haircuts. Mm -hmm. uh, we had people that came that wanted to do our laundry for us, for pay, mm -hmm. and uh, that happened. There was a man used to come every day. I have a nice little memory. I actually have pictures at home, sitting on a little folding chair, giving us a haircut, and a shave for about 25 cents. <laughs> and he used to come every day. He had like two or 3,000 Marines that needed a shave and a haircut. Wow. So he had a good thing going. Shave and a haircut, two bits. <laughs> sure, exactly. <laughs> so they, did they treat you all right? Yes, they did. Okay. Yeah. And you actually have a photo yes. from that period. Yeah, I have several photos here. Uh, but this is the one that was shot of you in Beirut. Yes. And you are the, you're the gentleman. I'd, I'd be in the rear here, you're in the, the center. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And this most of these men were actually were, not all of them, but quite a few of them were from Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Because when I joined the Marines, we were all from Massachusetts at the time, mm -hmm. and quite a few of us stayed together. Mm -hmm. So I'll take that. And this is a photo of you and your unit, yes. and that is the machine you were working right. on. Right. They were called P5s at the time. P5. P-5s, it's a landing craft that they mm -hmm. put a squad of Marines in and you make a landing. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did with us was we took those there, we made the landing and then we just drove up onto this mountain mm -hmm. and parked it there. And which one are you in this photo? This photo here, over here on the far right oh, okay. with the black hair, mm -hmm. no more. Now you mentioned um, Mr. Jacobs, yes. who was a Natick, and you mentioned he was killed? That's right. What yeah. happened to him? Jackie Jacobs and I went to St. Patrick's together from the first grade, graduated from high school together, mm -hmm. and he and I were in boot camp together in two different platoons. We got out of the Marines on Valentine's Day. He was not killed in the Marines. He was mm -hmm. killed shortly after. Mm -hmm. We got out of the Marines on Valentine's Day, 1959, 
And he went to work, I believe, for the town of Framingham. Mm -hmm. And over in Saxonville, they were digging a trench in August for doing like a water service or surge, mm -hmm. whatever it was, and it caved in on him. Oh, wow. And he was hit. They tried to get him out with a backhoe, and the story goes that that backhoe hit him and killed him. Oh. And you know what his job in the Marines was? He was a football player. Big, handsome boy. He played football for Camp Lejeune, and that was his job. Wow. And he was, uh, just last week, as a matter of fact, when I went to a funeral, he's buried at St. Patrick's, mm -hmm. and his birthday and mine are only a week apart. Mm. So I said, uh, he was an awful nice guy. Mm. Yeah. Well, let's get back to you, yeah. and you're still in Lebanon for yeah. six months. Yes. So this is now around uh, the o latter part of 58. Yes, latter part of 58, be mm -hmm. around October, we came home. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I have some nice letters of thank you there, and there's a, there's a piece of paper that I have that shows that we were in Beirut that they gave us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came back to the States, and uh, now it's uh, Christmas time, 1958, and I'm home, getting ready to be discharged, uh, you know, in about six or eight weeks. But I'll throw this in as a nice little story. It's Christmas, 1958, and another man and I hitchhike home uh, to the George Washington Bridge in New York City. Mm -hmm. And I spent the night with him. He lived right near the George Washington Bridge. So we went out, we had a few drinks and a sandwich. And sometime around four or five o'clock in the morning, I got my duffel bag and I put my hat on and my Marine uniform on. I'm standing under the George Washington Bridge. It's Christmas morning and this big, nice, new, shiny car stops to give me a ride home. But it was interesting who was driving the car. It was a black man and his wife and two little children. Mm -hmm. You gotta remember now, when I started, I talked about being segregated mm -hmm. and I've never forgot that man. They picked me up under the George Washington Bridge about five o'clock in the morning and they gave me a ride to Hartford, Connecticut. So a couple of years ago, along those lines, I saw a black man walking home from Tilly and Salvi's over on Bacon Street in the rain with two bundles, total stranger. I stopped my car, I says, where are you going? He says, I'm going down to my friends in Natick. He says, uh, I says, would you like a ride? He says, yes. And I gave him a ride home in the rain that day. And mm -hmm. I told him the reason I stopped to pick up a stranger I says, because somebody picked me up under the George Washington mm -hmm. Bridge. Yeah. I've never forgot that. It, uh -huh. it was very impressive when they picked me up that mm -hmm. morning. Let's talk a bit about your duties uh, while you were in the Marine Corps. And you were telling me before the interview that you had hearing loss yes. as a result of your duties. Tell me about that. Well, when they sent me to school in California to be a mechanic, uh, the normal duties on those uh, P5s was that you'd be driving it, uh, maintaining it, but I got a job as a mechanic, and there was a V12 Continental engine located inside of it, a huge engine with a very large exhaust system, mm -hmm. and there was a hatch that went by the exhaust that you climbed down in there. So my duties basically almost for the whole three years, because I went to school in the very beginning, was to uh, maintain those engines on the, uh, the P5s. And uh, I uh, really enjoyed the, uh, that job because we were always in and out of the water. We were landing crafts and coming from Massachusetts with the ocean. So I said, we were always floundering around down in North Carolina somewhere going in and out of the surf. Mm -hmm. But you had to be careful because there were plugs in the bottom of those things that came out like bilge, bilge pumps. Mm -hmm. and they had drains. One time somebody forgot to put them back in. And, uh -oh. and oh, it was a real problem. He got in a lot of trouble. Oh dear. <laughs> but uh, we never had any problems. Mm -hmm. no. So how did you lose your hearing? Well, I think it was just from the noise, mm -hmm. you know, constant noise from the, uh, the exhaust uh, and uh, just the, the, the overall noise from the machinery. Mm -hmm. So you're back in the Natick area, Christmas 58. Yep. What happened in the last uh, months before your enlistment ended? That last... Uh, uh, be honest with you, not much. I says it was Christmas, went back to Camp Lejeune. I'm going to be discharged the 14th of February, which is only about six weeks away. So really, the last six weeks I was in the Marines, it was almost like being on, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, like R&R &R they call mm -hmm. it, rest and recuperation. We, we weren't doing much. 
So it was, uh, yeah, and I, I really enjoyed the three years I spent in the Marines. Did you consider uh, signing up? Oh yes, they wanted us to sign up and, uh, and stay in, and I came very close to it because they promoted me to sergeant there just about the time that I came back from the, for the duty in Beirut. And uh, I decided to get out of the Marines, and there was four or five of us that had joined together. We all came home. And I went to work for General Motors in Framingham. And after I was there for six months, I said to my father one day, I says, you know, Dad, I'm going back in the Marines. I says, it was much easier in the Marines than working for General Motors, welding, making automobiles. <laughs> but I never did go back in the Marines. You stuck with General Motors? No, I left General Motors. I took the civil, civil service exam, and I worked for the town of Natick Fire Department for 32 years. As a firefighter, et cetera? As a firefighter. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing these days? Well, at the same time I was a fireman, I've been restoring antique furniture for about 50 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm still working, self-employed. Mm -hmm. And I like to make things and repair things. So. Did you join any service organizations? Yes, uh, I, I belong to the uh, Marine Corps League Metro West Detachment. And uh, at one time I was a, an associate member of the American Legion, mm -hmm. but to this day, even though I was out of the country for a year, you can't belong to those organizations because it was the Cold War, it was peacetime. And there's a, there's a period from about 1956 to mm -hmm. 1959, right when I was in, that were really not considered veterans <laughs> by, by the rules yeah. mm -hmm. of, of joining the uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. So I said, I, don't, I, I belong, I'm a life member of the AMVETS, mm -hmm. and I belong to the uh, uh, Marine Corps League, as I said. Yeah. Now, Ron, you wanted to mention a study in which you are a part of. Yes, there's a uh, few years ago, there was a, uh, an ad in the uh, few of the military books. If you were stationed at Camp Lejeune during the 50s and 60s, uh, the water was contaminated and uh, people have been getting cancer and dying. Mm -hmm. So I called the number and they sent me all the information. I filled it out and uh, I sent it back to them and I brought in a piece of paper there that uh, gives the information. I think it would be any, very interesting, anybody that looks at this in the future, mm -hmm. that there is a study because a lot of people don't even realize it, but the water, uh, the water was con contaminated by solvents and so forth into the mm -hmm. wells. And uh, there have been some uh, people that have been dying from this. I've been very lucky. I don't have any uh, effects as of yet. And uh, I don't think I will because even though Camp Lejeune was my home, as I said earlier, I was in California, I was at Little Creek, Virginia, I was overseas. Mm -hmm. And Courthouse Bay is about 25 miles, even though it's on Camp Lejeune, it's about 25 miles from the main base. Mm -hmm. So I said, I think I might have been lucky that I was uh, not near those particular wells. But you've had friends who weren't so lucky. I have had friends that weren't so lucky. Everybody, not everybody, but people that lived in Natick all knew Jerry Stanhope. Mm -hmm. And Jerry Stanhope was only, he was a very good friend of mine. He was only about 53 years old. He passed away. Uh, Bobby Kent was a fireman, same age, about 50 years old. He was in the Marines at the same time. He passed away with cancer. So those are two that I know. And actually, I don't know why, what he died from, but there was a fellow named Bruce Nattenville that was in the Marines with me. And he was a school teacher up in Worcester, and I called him up one day, and his wife said, no, he died of cancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's three people that I know that were like 50 years old that died of cancer that were there. Now, whether they mm -hmm. Now, is this study uh, commissioned by the federal government? Yes, it's by the federal government, and uh, they've passed laws and things recently uh, to help people, you know, to, if, you get, if you have cancer, they're willing to help you and mm -hmm. uh, look into it. Do you know if the camp has since uh, cleaned up the contaminants? I would have to assume that they have. I don't know that for a fact, but I says I'd have to assume that they've cleaned it up. Because I think it ended, they discovered it or it ended around the 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, right. Now, Ron, you got out of the Marines at sort of like a crucial juncture. You were 
you got out just before Vietnam. Exactly. Uh, yeah. What's your um, take on that? Well, my obligation was for six years, so it ran until 1962. Mm -hmm. And I was always wondering uh, what would have happened if I'd ever stayed in the Marines, because the man's name I mentioned earlier, uh, Bucko Walsh, mm -hmm. Bucko actually did stay in the Marines. And he told me one day right over in front of the Natick Federal, Ronnie, it's not like when we were in Beirut, he says, he'd just come back from Vietnam. He says, they're trying to kill us over there. Mm -hmm. So I says, uh, I consider myself very lucky that when I was in and when I got out compared to all the other people that I know that were there and mm -hmm. lost their lives or mental problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what about um, Vietnam veterans? The, I mean, I've, you know, I've been hearing some, uh, a lot of stories from Vietnam veterans and how they had been mistreated over the years by the American public. Uh, that might have been what happened to them. Myself, when I was discharged from the Marine Corps, nothing happened. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the day that I got discharged from the Marines, they just said, go home. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, nobody ever gave us any information like on health or welfare or counseling or anything like that. It was just Valentine's Day came in 1959 and somebody said to me a few days before, sign this, sign that, and we went home. End of story. And it was basically that way for, uh, for my career for forever. I never got too much ever information about the Marines. Mm -hmm. And what do you think of the efforts now, at least in Massachusetts, toward uh, helping veterans? Oh yeah, it seems, you know, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, I said, you see, you read a lot in the newspaper and you hear a lot about it help for the veterans, especially coming back. I have a, uh, my wife's niece is from Framingham and she was overseas just recently and her and her husband both were over there and they both have problems and uh, they get a lot of help from the VA. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I says, I think they're doing a pretty good job taking care of them. I think one of the biggest things is, I'm not sure, is that, that the veterans coming back, sometimes I don't think they take advantage of the what's available. They don't even know what's available. Mm -hmm but possibly today they're better informed than we were. Mm -hmm. And I saw in one of your little piles there yep. uh, the Toys for Tots. Toys for Tots, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, when the Marine Corps League started in Natick, uh, I'm not sure exactly, say 10 years ago, I was chairman for the Toys for Tots for two or three years. And we had some very, very successful years collecting the Toys for Tots, in which they still do today. Mm -hmm. But I had a couple of heart attacks, and my dad died, and I so so I haven't been as active as active in that as I used to be. Mm -hmm. Rondi, um, are there any other stories you want to tell us about why your life in the Marines? Stories in the Marines. Uh, any other colorful characters? We've got to shut the camera off for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> uh, well, let me think for a minute. Colorful characters. Not too colorful, but I made a few good friends while I was in the Marines. That uh, I've never. Uh, it's, it's interesting, you know. You read about organizations and they have reunions and everything. Mm -hmm. At my time, I don't think the bond was quite there because I says we've never had any reunions or uh, gone back to anything. Uh, the one fellow from Worcester, he was probably my best friend when I called him. He had died 20 mm -hmm. years ago. And there's a fellow down in North Carolina that I knew, Jack Garrison, that went over to Beirut with me. I called him once or twice. But uh, characters, no, I guess we were all characters at the time. <laughs> we're all, all young Marines having a good time. Okay. And do you believe uh, serving in the military was a benefit for you? Oh, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you read in the. Uh, I wouldn't have had it any other way. I, mm -hmm. says, I left Natick High School. Uh, one of the reasons I left was that I had, I had gone to about four different high schools in about three years, uh, in Akron, Ohio, Hartford, Connecticut, and Natick. Mm -hmm. We were moving all around. And uh, I just, I, I don't know, I, I, it's kind of hard to explain, but I says, mm -hmm. when I joined the Marines, I enjoyed every minute of it. Mm -hmm. And I still enjoy all my memories of the Marines today. 
You said you didn't graduate from Natick High. Did you get a diploma? I got my diploma because I think the recruiter must have told me that if you had a B average, the state of Massachusetts, it was, they gave you your diploma. Okay. So it was either my mother picked it up or it was mailed to us, mm -hmm. uh, but I graduated from Natick High School with a diploma. Okay. But uh, evidently the way the laws worked that you had to go till sometime in February mm -hmm. and then uh, they gave it to you. Ron, is there anything else you'd like to say uh, for those who are going to be watching this in the future? Uh, well, we could go, could go on and on about the military in my family, but I said, uh, mm -hmm. I said, that's the way we got this country today is for all the sacrifice that all the young men have made over the mm -hmm. hundreds of years. And I find that very sad that we're still doing it today mm -hmm. over there and people are losing their lives and I don't know when we're ever going to learn, but I said, uh, my own family, it goes back hundreds of years, all the way back, you know, the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, and uh, we just don't seem to be able to mm -hmm. live with each other for whatever reason. Yeah. yeah. Well, Ron Michael, we thank you so much for coming in and interviewing for the Native Veterans Oral History Project. All right. Thank okay. you very much. It was my pleasure. Mm -hmm.